be focusing more on the people side of quality. Uh, some of the slides uh, will come from the Everything Disc Work of Leaders uh, one day training uh, that I am authorized to deliver. I have added things, however, to focus on quality leaders in uh, to be more specific uh, to our audience and the, the needs of us as uh, quality leaders. Uh, so you will see this everything uh, DISC logo appear uh, some places and some places uh, not. Uh, Norval's already introduced me, so we'll skip that real fast. Uh, the learning objectives that, that I've set for today is to first talk about and define what is a leader. And then to learn the behaviors of a leader, and a specifically quality leader, and the uh, DISC model and how that informs our behaviors as a leader, focusing on the eight dimensions of leadership. And then uh, the work of leaders uh, process and the drivers and behaviors that go along with that. And we'll close with a call to action for you developing your own plans to improve your own uh, leadership abilities. So first of all, what is a leader? Well, if you look up leader in the dictionary, you will get the first two bullets here. A person with commanding authority or influence or a principal officer or senior leader in an organization. Uh, other places you may find the other uh, bullets here, person that sets expectations and for organizational performance and improvement. Or um, the next to last one is perhaps one that's not as uh, commonly known or recognized, but James Hunter in his book, The Servant, defines a leader as a servant, someone who's humble, caring, and investing in others for the, for the good of all. Uh, you may be familiar with Jim Collins and his work on uh, great organizations, and he talks often about level five leadership, where a level five leader is one who builds enduring greatness, so sustainable greatness, through personal integrity and professional will, or that turning intention into action. It's not a charismatic or commanding um, person who operates through authority but someone with integrity and professional will. Uh, some additional thoughts on leadership quotes by um, various uh, folks. My favorite is the fourth one, the test of your leadership is simple. Are the people entrusted to your care better off? And if you do that, then the last one I think is possible, that a leader serves others to empower them uh, to change the world. So what does ASQ say about leadership, and specifically about the different roles in leadership that we recognize through our certifications? If you look at the body of knowledge for each of the different certifications, you will find some of these uh, phrases that you can connect uh, to uh, leadership at different levels. So as a quality manager, uh, you're from the certification perspective, expected to lead and champion improvement, lead teams, focus on relationships, planning, overcome roadblocks to achieve desired performance, motivate and sustain enthusiasm. You see similar terminology and phrases in the uh, master, Six Sigma Master Black Belt body and knowledge as well. And in the quality engineering, Body and knowledge, again, similar things that keep appearing, supporting planning, leading and championing improvement, working with others to solve problems, overcoming roadblocks to achieve desired performance, motivating and sustaining others' motivation. And even for roles that we maybe don't traditionally think of as leaders, the Certified Quality Technician and the Certified Quality Improvement Associate, we see some of that same uh, terminology. So leadership is not just at the executive suite level, but it's at all levels and all levels within our quality profession. Last year sometime, I came across this uh, graphic on the right-hand side of uh, the screen from a European quality resource, and 
I have unfortunately forgotten where I found it, uh, but it's something that I think relates very well to this body and knowledge. They identified eight behaviors of quality professionals. And this might be a little uh, difficult for you to read, so I'll put a little words around each one of these. Uh, stakeholder advocate. So as a behavior, this is being the conscience of the organization for ensuring customer and stakeholder requirements are addressed. Fact-based thinker, so decision-based, uh, database decision-making. Uh, quality planner, preventing potential problems, planning to prevent pr potential problems. Quality coach, developing the knowledge and the capabilities of others in the organization to use quality principles and tools. Quality advocate, uh, having a clear vision for quality in the organization. Uh, systems thinker, looking across the entire organization, so horizontal thinking uh, to promote a holistic or big picture view of the organization and its quality requirements. Quality collaborator, Again, works across the entire supply chain, the entire organization, customers, suppliers to customers to resolve issues for the delivery of quality products and services. And lastly, quality motivator motivates and empowers others to take accountability for achieving standards of performance. I don't think any of us would disagree, at least I hope not, with those as key behaviors of a quality professional. So how do you discover your own leadership style? Uh, we'll look at that and we'll consider that uh, through two dimensions. And these uh, dimensions define the DISC model that I'll also share with you in a minute here. So think first of all, how do you see yourself? Are you um, active, fast-paced, outspoken, or uh, thoughtful, cautious, and reflective? That will define um, one of our dimensions. Second dimension, oops, are you um, questioning, maybe perhaps a little skeptical, or are you more accepting? That will define our second dimension. And those then will define four quadrants that can be summarized in this uh, DISC model. And if you were in the upper left-hand corner, you would be identified through the DISC model as having a D style, where D stands for dominance. Be results-focused, driven, very direct. Kind of if you had to summarize your style in a phrase, it would be kind of get it done. Then in the upper right-hand corner, it would be identified as an I or influence style. And that's a more expressive, social, charming, um, love everybody kind of style. And again, if you had to summarize in a simple phrase, that would be let's get together. On the lower left is, it would be an S style, or S stands for steadiness, and this would be someone that is even-tempered, humble, patient, accommodating, or simplifying that into a simple phrase, it's let's get along. And lower left would be identified as a C style for conscientious. And uh, someone in that quadrant would be more analytical, precise, private, and systematic. They're the get, let's get it right um, style. Uh, now, all the styles are equally valuable, and we are all actually a blend of all four. We may be more comfortable in one quadrant than any of the others. It just means that it's easier for us to be in that quadrant, and we have to stretch or work harder to be in the others, but we're really a blend of all four. But your style will be influenced over time by your experiences, your education, and your maturity level. Why know and understand your style? Well, understanding yourself better will help you become a more effective leader. It will also help you to understand others 
styles, and that can help you improve the quality of your workplace and build a more effective workplace. Those styles can also inform our leadership style, and there are eight leadership styles or dimensions that are in these bold words around the outside of the circle, and they more or less correspond to the four quadrants. So let's uh, look uh, briefly at these. So I do want to make a point before doing that, that each style has healthy behaviors, behaviors that create that effective um, work environment, but if overused or under conflict or pressure or stress, could create unhealthy behaviors. So there are pros and cons to, uh, to all of this, I think, as we recognize in our own uh, personalities and our own styles and how we respond to things. Uh, but let's look at the eight um, dimensions of leadership, and I'll just highlight a couple here because there's a lot of words here. Um, I'm going to choose uh, energizing uh, as one to talk about. This someone that has this uh, leadership uh, dimension is optimistic, charming, full of energy, uh, but under pressure can become disorganized and a little frantic. Best practices, best leadership practices that someone with this dimension exhibit are building enthusiasm with their fellow teammates, uh, making connections, building relationships um, with a variety of people, and leading the rally, being the cheerleader in the organization. So those are things that can help them in their and help perhaps the rest of us that don't have that style be more effective as uh, leaders. The other one on this next slide that I will focus on is the one that's diagonally opposite from energizing is resolute. Someone that has a resolute leadership dimension is independent, focused on results and efficient results in particular. They have high standards for themselves and for others. Uh, under stress, under pressure, however, may become overly critical and ignore the feelings of other people. Best practices that they exhibit is their ability and willingness to hold others accountable, uh, finding and addressing problems, and making unpopular decisions. So what's your style? You can through just to the descriptions uh, that I gave, and we'll be getting uh, handouts of this uh, to you all after the webinar. Uh, but what is your style? You can estimate what it is through your own self-reflection and asking others around you what they believe uh, your style is using these uh, definitions. Or at the end of our presentation, I will give you an opportunity to get a, a free profile and report on what your style is. And now how does that uh, tie into your work as a leader? Uh, there is a process uh, of being a leader, which I think is so appropriate as quality professionals because one of our key concepts is that all work is a process. So being a leader is a process that consists of three steps. Step one, crafting a vision. Step two, building alignment. Step three, championing execution. Now within each step, there are three drivers, or you might think of them as best practices. And within each best practice, there are behaviors and a continuum of behaviors that support that best practice. And we'll explore each of those within those eight dimensions. Where did this model come from? It is uh, based on a four-year effort by Inscape Publishing that was done in the late 1990s, I believe. Inscape is now part of Wiley. So they have merged it with their everything uh, disk uh, work. Uh, what the researchers did was analyze and distilled the work of leaders from the last 30 years, and then also tested out their theories 
with over 300 subject matter es experts in 150 organizations around the world. So this is a global model, not just a North America model. Uh, they do recognize in their research that leadership is influenced by a variety of factors, such as your life experiences, your education, your maturity level. And uh, so why look at this? Why understand your leadership? So, and I think, again, as quality professionals, we understand that um, if we're going to be a good leader, we need to do a little bit of continuous improvement on our processes. So hopefully through this, you'll get some ideas for how uh, to do that. The first step, again, was vision. And so what is vision? A uh, vision is an imagined future state. It's something that's broader in scope than a, uh, a goal for this year or a goal for this week. It's something that seeks an organization seeks to create unique, unquestionable value or to serve the world in some new way uh, or to reinvent itself in how it does business. It's important because it helps uh, individuals in the organization expand their thinking about what can be done. And it provides a purpose for them as an organization, as a team, and as individuals that can lead to the development of strategies and actions and unite people around a common purpose. Probably one of the most uh, famous um, vision statements was uh, the one that John F. Kennedy made in 1961 about putting a man on the moon before the end of the decade, which in July of 1969 we did. And that drove a lot of action and research, uh, not only in the government, but in numerous organizations um, across the country. And if you think about it, a lot of scientific discoveries and things that we kind of take for granted today had their birth during that time period. A lot of inventions that came out of uh, this time period and the work that went into accomplishing this vision. Now, I think we make the mistake that visioning is just for the senior leaders of an organization. But really, all leaders, no matter where we are in the organization, are responsible for crafting visions. It may look different at different levels or different parts of the organization, but we all have a responsibility for crafting a vision in your vision being in support of the larger vision of the organization. So what are the drivers for crafting a vision from a leadership standpoint? What are the best practices? Three of them, exploration, boldness, and testing assumptions. So let's uh, look at, uh, somehow it skipped ahead to boldness here. There should be a exploration one here. And I don't know why it's not showing up here, but I'll put some words to that. Um, exploring, there's two behavioral um, continua there, remaining, being open that is entertaining new ideas, new possibilities, versus the extreme of just going what you already know, making decisions and, and plans very quickly based upon what you know at the moment, versus opening up to new ideas and new possibilities. The second behavioral item that goes with exploration, excuse me, exploration, is prioritizing the big picture. So focusing on a broad overall view of the situation at hand to get as many ideas and opportunities uh, out there versus being more focused on details where you're attending to more individual uh, elements of a plan. Then uh, bold is a best practice, a driver, has two behavioral items, adventurous and speaking out. And this continuum, if you're on the right-hand side, you're more comfortable with being behaving in this way, 
then you are behaving on what's on the left-hand side. And the right-hand side and all these similar graphs I will share is the best practice side. So adventures versus being cautious. So being um, willing and actually excited to take risks and to step out of your comfort zone. So this aligns with one of our future speakers who will be talking about risk-based thinking. Uh, then the second behavioral continuum is speaking out versus holding back, where the best practice speaking out is being um, willing uh, to hold uh, to volunteer bold ideas and to put your own credibility in the line with those those ideas versus holding back where you're hesitant to say something for fear that you might be challenged or that your credibility um, might be put on the line. Going back to our dimensions, someone that's adventurous may fit into the commanding or pioneering uh, leadership dimension. Someone who is willing to volunteer and speak out may fit into the commanding or resolute uh, leadership uh, style. The last uh, driver best practice in visioning is testing assumptions, and there are two behaviors associated with that, seeking counsel and exploring implications. Seeking counsel is consulting with trusted advisors to evaluate and test your risks and outcomes versus the alternative of making decisions autonomously and moving on without asking for input. So it's the two-way discussion versus one way. And someone that would be comfortable with, oh, sorry about that. Someone that would be comfortable with seeking counsel may fit into the affirming or inclusive leadership dimension. The second behavioral continuum here, exploring implications, meaning showing patience and evaluating ideas and opportunities to do a pros and cons, advantages, disadvantages kind of analysis versus someone who's going to just push forward without doing that, moving quickly to make progress. And the exploring implications side, the leadership dimension there may be someone who's more resolute or commanding versus pushing forward more pioneering or resolute. So crafting a vision will involve exploring being open to new ideas, taking risks, being bold, testing those assumptions that come in through those new open ideas and risks. Second step is then once you have that vision, Alignment, so that's building alignment around that vision. That's really a critical step for turning the vision into reality. But it requires continual, and I probably should underline that word, continual communication upwards, downwards, and across the organization. It's not a one-time activity. It's an ongoing activity. And there are three drivers or best practices there that are clarity, dialogue, and inspiration. Clarity has two behavioral continuum. One, explaining rationale. Oh, man, my mouse is jumping ahead here. Uh, explaining rationale. And then second, st structuring messages. So explaining rationale, being able to communicate the reasoning, the facts behind an idea or decision, the why. I think in a webinar that we heard several months ago, we had a speaker here in the Blue Ridge section that shared the ADCAR model. And one of the things that she wrote down that really struck me was that 80, 90% of the time, someone understands the why behind a change or a decision. They will jump on board. So it's being able to explain that why, that rationale that will facilitate alignment versus just simply communicating opinions. Second behavioral characteristic is structured messaging. So organizing what you say, organizing, putting some logic behind 
how you express the reasoning and the facts versus just speaking on off the cuff. Someone that would perhaps do uh, structured messaging would be a more deliberate and resolute in a leadership style. And someone that would be more impromptu would be more energizing uh, style, more energizing or affirming style. Third, best practice is inspiration. So helping people understand the why and structuring the message and then inspiring them to be a part of it. Two behavioral aspects there. First, exchanging perspectives. So encouraging dialogue, encouraging two-way discussion around new ideas and information and how to make the vision a reality. Versus one-way communication where you're just pushing information out and not giving people an opportunity to talk about it. Uh, folks that would encourage uh, dialogue uh, would be uh, affirming and energizing, engaging, friendly uh, leadership style. Second behavioral aspect is being receptive, and that is where you're inviting different points of view, different ideas versus challenging them, responding with skepticism, not giving much opportunity for uh, dialogue. A leadership style that would be on this receptive end would be inclusive and humble. So building alignment involves clarity, dialogue, and inspiration. Uh, inspiration. Uh, Last one, the two behavioral characteristics here are expressive and encouraging. Someone that is expressive, comfortable being expressive, upbeat and lively in their communication style versus being reserved. Uh, an expressive a leader may be an energizing or affirming leader. We go back to our eight dimensions. Encouraging someone that is in demonstrating an encouraging leadership behavior will inspire others versus simply focusing on the practical and the facts. And in this case, it would might be a leadership style, again, that is energizing or in affirming. So you may recognize from some of the references I made back to the eight dimensions that to do these best practices, to implement these best practices around alignment, you need more than one leadership style. and So it's a, really a team effort, a, a team effort of leaders that can bring these different leadership styles to the table for clarity, dialogue, and, and inspiration. And to do that continually, not being an, a one-time event, but to continually monitor and realign against uh, the vision. Third step in the process is execution. I'd like you to take a second and think about a leader that you've had experience with and consider what they did um, to, to execute against the vision. I think this is one of the hardest things to do is to make that transition from being open and visioning to then being more tactical and making it happen. So think about people that you saw do this and how they did it and what were the attributes or the behaviors that they exhibited. Now in the work of leaders um, model, this is one place where uh, Wiley Everything Disc makes a distinction between leader and manager and where leader is a one-to-many relationship and the leader ensures strategies and people are in place to make the, vis the vision a reality versus a manager is a one-to-one -one relationship and managers guide day-to-day -day execution, so much more tactical, task-focused role. Now, execution is very important. It's where the rubber meets the road. It helps to propel the development of very concrete strategies 
makes the vision actionable, gives people a sense of accomplishment that they have accomplished something that's bigger than themselves. And once again, execution is at all levels of an organization for all leaders. Every leader has a role to make the vision a reality. Now that role may look very different depending on where you are in the organization. Depending on where you are, you may be more or less hands-on, you may be advocating for, or you may be providing, you may be the provider of resources. You may be creating strategy or following strategy, establishing a culture or supporting the culture. It will depend on where you are in the organization, but all leaders have a responsibility for execution. Once again, we have three drivers, momentum, structure, and feedback. Uh, momentum behaviors, two are driven and initiating. Uh, a driven leader is one that has a sense of urgency, urges others to move quickly versus being low key, being laid back and uncomfortable to urge others to increase their pace of work. Uh, a leader style that is more driven would be commanding or resolute perhaps even pioneering. A uh, second behavior continuum is initiating. So that is anticipating opportunities and problems and calling attention to them. So again, the risk-based thinking idea versus a leader that's more reactive, waiting for something to happen before taking action. And leader uh, style, the eight that goes along with the initiating is um, being a commanding uh, leader style. Second best practice is structure. And here the behaviors are planning and analyzing in depth. And planning is developing an organized course of action, setting expectations and deadlines versus figuring things out as we go along, kind of just in time. Someone who's more on the left-hand side of this continuum would be a leader that's resolute or deliberate, more focused on organizing and making things systematic. Uh, analyzing in depth as a behavior, being looking at the facts and the details, and basing the plans on that versus reacting to the first impression as the extreme. Someone who's more on the analyze uh, would be a leader that has a deliberate or a resolute style. Feedback is the third driver under execution. Two behaviors there are addressing problems and offering praise. Uh, addressing problems on the right-hand side of the continuum, so being able and willing to deal with issues confront problems, conflict, versus the other extreme of seeking to maintain harmony and keep a calm, peaceful environment. Someone who would be more likely, a leader style that would be more likely to address problems head on would be a commanding leader, pioneering leader. Uh, a, um, affirming or inclusive or humble leader would be more on the harmony side. Second behavioral continuum is offering praise. So looking for opportunities to recognize and compliment others for their contributions. This would be someone that has an affirming or inclusive or humble leader style versus a commanding or a resolute or pioneering style that would be less comfortable with recognizing and complimenting others. So turning a vision into reality is execution and involves momentum, structure or planning, and then feedback, encouragement, praise, addressing problems. And one of the most important things about execution is that all leaders at all levels demonstrate commitment and support to execution of the vision. So it's being that cheerleader 
keeping that momentum going, that sense of urgency, planning, checking in, monitoring progress. So how does this relate to the leadership behaviors of a quality leader? And are there gaps that we need to work on as a profession? I uh, did this presentation and asked these questions to uh, our colleagues in the, blue, in the Northern Shenandoah Valley section. And we took these eight leadership behaviors from the model I shared with you earlier and then mapped them to the three steps. And this is what we came up with. We did a little hands-on exercise in the room with a poster on the wall. Fortunately, we can't do that online. And this is what um, we came up with within the Northern Shenandoah Valley section. An observation that we made when we stepped back and looked at it was that there, uh, vision and alignment appears multiple times, but execution only appears three times. So perhaps as a quality profession, we has, have an opportunity to improve our execution, to do momentum, structure, and feedback more. Be interested in what you think about that. Uh, so action planning, what's a call to action? As I said earlier, it's a process. And as quality professionals, we're all about improving processes. So we ought to be all about improving our own uh, leadership process. But as any improvement, it takes effort. And so we've got to take some action. And the experience that I've had and others I'm sure and the call have had is as you take action, capitalizing on what are your strengths, and then finding opportunities to address challenges. So how might you do that? Well, learn about your style. Learn about your strengths and areas that may be more challenging to you as a leader and identify the benefits of improving in those areas. So kind of what's in it for me? What's in it for me to make the effort to make this improvement? And then develop an action plan for improvements. Specifically, what I challenge you to do is, as I mentioned earlier, I can get you a eight-dimension profile at no cost. All you have to do is notify me, because uh, I'll need your email to send you a link to complete the eight dimension uh, inventory. Then once you receive that, you will get a report generated from Wiley. that will be sent to you at that same email. And it will reference uh, the eight dimensions and generically refer to the descriptions that I had in earlier tables and also refer to the book that came out of uh, their research what I commit to do is once you have completed that and received that profile, that I will send you a re additional information that will be more quality focused so that you can put this in the context of your role as a quality leader. And once you have that, you can identify what are the drivers and the behaviors that are your strengths and identify times when you've exhibited these so that you know, hey, I've already, I've already doing this, build some confidence around those strengths. And then identify the areas where you need improvement. Those areas in one of the earlier tables that I shared where it was um, where under pressure you m may respond or areas where, that you overuse and how you could increase your effectiveness. And also looking at the best practices, not only of your style, but of the style that's diagonally opposite yours to give you ideas for what kinds of best practices, things that you can do to improve your leadership style. Then get very specific and create some plans for implementing those best practices. Tell a friend, tell a colleague, tell your boss, whoever you're comfortable with that will hold you accountable to those plans in a timeline. Execute them and reflect back on your performance. So it's my call to action to you to improve your leadership so that you can be a more effective, a more effective quality leader. 
And if you are interested in learning more about the work of leaders or leadership in general, these are some of my favorite uh, references. The work on leaders and the eight dimensions, you may find details on that in the top two references. Uh, one of my additional favorites is the third one, the book, The Servant. It's written as a novel, um, but it, I think, would open your eyes to the role of a leader, uh, perhaps different than what we traditionally hear in an industry setting or a commercial setting. Then all of the books by Patrick Lencioni on the five dysfunctions of a team and teaming and leadership in general are excellent resources. And then Jim Collins' uh, work on great organizations and Cotter's work on leading change is really about walking through that three-step process, creating a vision, uh, championing alignment, and execution. What questions can I answer? Okay, Susan, thanks very much. Uh, looking in the chat box, uh, we do have some questions for you. Uh, the first one is, by knowing your leadership style, how do you use the information in an existing environment? It seems to have more use in directing a person to a certain environment. I'm not sure what you mean by a certain environment. I think you, you know your own leadership style and then know what are the, where are your strengths, and then where are some areas that you perhaps overuse thinking about here? Going back to the two examples that I gave, one being an energizing style, the um, areas of strength there are excitement, charm, optimism, energy, so that would maybe be more on being expressive and encouraging, exchanging perspectives, and praising other members in your group. But you may not be as comfortable with structured, measure, structured messaging, uh, planning, and organizing, uh, or maybe even following through, so thinking about um, initiating action from an execution standpoint. So those may be areas that you need to work on. And the diagonally opposite style is resolute. So we can look at what are the best practices that a resolute leader has, and that is uh, the three identified there are holding others accountable, uh, finding and addressing problems, and making unpopular decisions. So identifying where can I do that in my work today? What are some projects or some things I'm working on today where I can, I can do this, I can practice this? And hold others accountable. Find and address problems in our current plans. Confront them versus being reacting to them. Making unpopular decisions. Not sure that answered the question, but hope it did. Anyways, gave some thought to that. What next, Norval? Okay, the next question we have here is, if you are in a hiring position, would it be wise to use your leadership style in the selection of your support staff? That's an interesting question. Now, the style, whether it's DISC or leadership, of course, those are related, as I explained, um, does not indicate a person's um, capability in terms of their knowledge, their experience, their technical abilities. It's their style. Now, you may seek through your hiring process to hire someone that is a good fit for the rest of the team, will help balance the rest of the team so that as a team, you're walking through vision alignment and execution together because no one person can demonstrate all of these at the 
best practice level. So you need the whole team working together uh, to, to do that. So you might, as you hire people, consider what is their style and how do they fit with the rest of the team for working together and creating an effective workplace. Now, in, in, your, in using your own style to hire someone, um, I think the row in the tables that I presented that will be in the handout that would be important there is to recognize how you judge others. Uh, for example, going back to the energizing style, and a person with an energizing leadership style will judge others by their social skills and their level of enthusiasm versus someone that's diagonally opposite at the resolute uh, will judge someone by their competence and their common sense. So you need to recognize how you're judging other people as a, a leader and take that into account in your hiring decision making. What else, okay. Normal? Uh, the next question, uh, the environment is not emphasized here, but may be implied. Wouldn't this be the alpha and omega of this presentation since taking a cue from Darwin, only the adaptable survive? Another interesting question on that. I need to think on that one for a while. So, it, uh, Norval, if you could, um, after we're done, uh, send me who they came from and I will respond. Uh, Okay. Then that one needs some more thought. <laughs> okay, sure, we can do that. Uh, let's see. Oh, and I see there's a clarification that was made uh, by the um, participant who asked the question earlier. Uh, he says, when I spoke of the environment, I was referring to a work environment. Knowing your leadership style seems to have more use in the selection of a work environment. I don't know if it has, I would not say it has more, but recognizing your own leadership style and knowing who you are, again, anytime the more you know yourself, the better decisions you can make, whether that is where you choose to work and how you fit into that environment, I think, yes, that's true. Okay, and then another comment. Uh, since we have a natural migration towards a leadership style, oh, I'm sorry, uh, it's a question. Uh, since we have a natural migration towards a leadership style, is it difficult to change one's leadership style if it is not compatible with somebody you support? Somebody you support. I'm not sure about the somebody you support. Yes, so if you have a natural style, you'll be more comfortable there and it'll be easier to work within that style. And if you want to change, emphasize some of the other behavioral aspects, it will be more stretching, more effort, more practice. So that's why it's important to put together a plan. If you're serious about improving your own leadership process, put together a plan, execute that plan, practice, 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 have somebody that you know and trust that can give you good feedback, hold you accountable uh, to doing that. Yeah, the clarification was added. Uh, this is meant uh, for somebody you support being a higher manager like your, like your boss. Trying to change their leadership style or yours? No, saying that since we have a natural migration towards a leadership style, is it difficult to change one's leadership style if it is not compatible with somebody, with, and somebody you, else? You report to, I guess, is ah. probably rather than support. Okay. So if your leadership style doesn't match up with your bosses, can you actually change your leadership style? Yeah, so like if you've got a very commanding boss that's very driven, bottom line oriented, and, and your natural style is much more um, affirming, more social and um, developing relationship oriented versus results, it may be, yeah, more work. It may be helping to educate your boss of 
each other's leadership strengths and identifying ways to leverage them versus seeing them as being in conflict with one another. And where can you work together and each bring your different strengths to the table? Okay, uh, not seeing any more questions in the chat box. Uh, if we do, if you do have a question, we'll take one more. Uh, we're pretty close to the top of the hour. Uh, yeah. While you're typing in your question, I will um, share this reminder. Next Tuesday, April 24th, will be our next webinar. It'll be risk-based thinking, being proactive versus reactive uh, with Vanessa McCormick of the ASQ Vancouver section. Uh, she's an executive director for VLM Solution Services Incorporated. And it looks like right now we're not seeing any other questions. Uh, with, with that, uh, I think well, we'll... Thank you once again, Norval. Thank you, Susan. Uh, it was great, great presentation. And as I didn't mention earlier when we first started up, this is actually your third time. Uh, it's third. Given a talk for us virtually, uh, so right now you're the one that ha holds that distinction of having offered a talk. Oh wow. 2016, 2017, and now 2018. And uh, we'd like to thank you for that. Is there a leadership style that says can't say no? <laughs> 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 well, anyway, uh, we're, we're glad you didn't say no to today, and uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that, I guess. Uh, we'll uh, also like to thank everybody else who turned in for us today, and uh, we hope to see you on our next webinar, which will be Tuesday. Uh, until then, uh, we'll wish everybody a good rest of the day, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye now. Thanks.